Okay, we're recording right now. All right, perfect. Yep, so uh, so welcome, guys. Sorry for the technical issues. It'd be no fun if we had a uh, WebEx without any technical issues. I don't remember the last time that happened. So uh, I'm glad I'm glad a couple of you were able to join. For those of you who are going to be listening to the recording, hello. Um, sorry you weren't hello. able to join us. I hope you were able to um, log in at some point this evening and find the recording. So today we're going to be covering how to run, how to create a neural network in R. Uh, neural networks are one of the coolest little pieces of, uh, of machine learning. Right, and I think in terms of predictive models, I was sitting around thinking about it last night because I have no life and I have nothing better to do with my time than um, sit around and think about this stuff. But, but uh, neural networks are like, they're like the sports car of machine learning models, right? They're kind of fancy and, and people like them a lot, but more importantly, they do one job. Well, not necessarily one job, but they do one job and they're a bit finicky, but they do it really, really, really well. Um, so if you have a lot of data and you have a complex thing that you want to model, a neural network can be a really good choice to do that. Um, and R has a couple of really powerful functions to do it. Uh, the reason I put up this little picture um, is because this is uh, the result of a Google neural network, excuse me, a, a picture enhancement um, neural network and it's actually run on a picture of like there's a sea and some rocks and a cliff and things like that. And as you run it through this algorithm and it enhances and it enhances and enhances, you can see that it picks out little patterns and then turns the little patterns into other things. And this is all driven by um, a neural network. All right. We also do um, self-driving cars are built with neural networks in some cases. Um, natural language processing and speech recognition and things like that um, are also built with, with neural networks. So they have a whole bunch of applications. Um, they can get very, very complicated. We're going to go through a few um, fairly simple examples. Uh, they are, though, one of the more um, complicated modeling types, right? A linear regression is not particularly complicated. Um, neural networks can be a bit finicky. Uh, they're a bit challenging sometimes to get correct um, and that's why I hope this will be this will be helpful but if you have a complex um, application that you need to do and you have a lot of data uh, that you want to work with then they are a great choice um, neural networks look like this you guys have probably seen this from the, the homework that you have we have a number of, of input pieces um, here trying to find a way to get my, uh, here we go, let's insert a shape. So in this line right here, we have all of our inputs. Um, these would be the things that we are using as inputs to our model. So if I was modeling um, what the miles per gallon uh, data set that we have in the class, this might be engine displacement, number of cylinders, um, and the weight of the car. These are the inputs. These hidden nodes, where the magic happens, as it were. Um, so each of these inputs feeds into each of the hidden nodes. And then some other computations happen in this hidden node. And then we get our output. And the output is just a combination of all of this stuff running together. What you can think of, though, the, the sort of simplest way to think of this, the way that I like to think of it, um, is that each of these input nodes is sorry each of these hidden nodes is essentially the result of a regression using each of these input nodes so there's one regression creates run regression using the three of these input nodes creates this first hidden node another regression creates the second hidden node another one creates the third one and another one creates the fourth one and then from each of these hidden nodes Another regression takes that all of those hidden nodes and creates this first output, and then all of the hidden nodes and creates the second output. So uh, the model itself is very, very complicated, but the basis for it is actually quite simple. And if you want to look, um, each of these lines, each of these arrows will have a weight assigned to it, and we'll see that as we go through. Um, and that weight is roughly not completely equivalent to the weight or the coefficient um, in a linear regression model. So that's a good way to think of the framework. Um, let's take a look at how we do that in R. 
So we're going to use a package called NeuralNet, um, which is one of a couple of popular packages for um, use in R. They, the other one's NNet, I think, is another very popular one, and there are some very um, fancy multi-processing versions that uh, we don't need to go through right now because we're not really building anything at this stage that, that's challenging enough to require that sort of power. Um, this script I'll give you so that you can download it afterwards. Um, there's a little table of contents up at the top here so you can look through um, where you need to look to find certain pieces. There's also a link to the documentation for the neural net package. Um, so if you want to find out what other functions are available within this package to uh, manipulate or look at your neural network, um, you can do that. Uh, the data that we're going to work with is some data uh, that I found somewhere online, I forget exactly where, uh, which has a number of metrics regarding student success. So what we're going to do is we're going to take um, some it's sort of demographic, um, situational, age information about um, some high school students, and then we're going to predict whether um, those students, what their grade would be um, at the end of the course. We're going to use a neural network to predict what their grade would be. So let's just, again, just take a look at the data. So we're just going to um, set our working directory, read in the data real quick, um, and then take a look at the structure of the data. So we have a number of um, different variables. The school is the, the school that they're in, obviously gender, age, um, their address. The address is not actually an address. It's whether they live in a rural or urban area. Um, family size, we have two levels of family size, either greater than or less than three. Um, parental status, whether their parents are uh, separated or together. Um, and then some information about their mother's education, father's education, mother's job, father's job, um, and then basically so on and so on and so on. A lot of these are ranked um, in different ways. None of them are very specific, and we'll take a look at that um, in just a second. So we have to do a bit of data manipulation in order to get these to work with our neural network. So if we look at this summary page, sorry, the summary of the data, um, you'll see that there are a good number of these that are ranked on a scale. So education um, goes from zero to four. Um, the time it takes them to travel to school goes from one to four. The amount of time they spend study, studying is one to four. Uh, and then we get down to absences, which goes from uh, zero to 75. Um, health is one to five. So you can see that we have a variety of, uh, of different scales for some of this data. Um, that's something that can be particularly challenging um, with a neural network. If we skip back to our diagram here, if you think of this, um, each of these as a regression, right? Scale doesn't matter in a regression because if this first number is particularly big, then the coefficient will be particularly big in order to take that into account. But when we start combining them, so we, we say that this these all feed into this hidden node up at the top, and then this hidden node feeds into the output. Once we fed everything into this hidden node, potentially this input, if it was a particularly large number and the others were particularly small numbers, this input can overweight that hidden node. And what we essentially get is a network that is just representative of this very first input because it has a large number. So that's not a big deal usually because we have variables on a fairly similar scale. But if I go back to R and we look at absences in this particular item here, you'll see that absences um, has a maximum value of 75. All of the others have a maximum value of five. Most of these are going to have a maximum value of one, right? All of these yes and no's are just going to be zero and one. So that's something we're going to need to take into account um, as we work through the data and as we pre-process the data before we put it into a, uh, a neural network. Um, so there's a couple of other ways to look at the data. We can look at the uh, names and we can look at the uh, first few rows of the data. Uh, we'll skip over that for now. The first thing we're going to do is I'm going to specifically encode some of these binary variables. Um, so we have, excuse me, we have the gender, uh, the address, family size, Etc. 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 I'm going to specifically code these as ones and zeros. Uh, it's not necessary to do that. R 
internally is already storing some of these factors as numbers. Um, it's a funky little lookup that it does to get to them. The reason I encode them specifically like this is because I want to know that when I have a yes or no field, ones always equal yes. Um, and when I have some of these other fields, right, I want these to be a bit logical. So the larger the family is a one and the smaller family is a zero, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's just an easy way for me to remember when I look at the data later on exactly what uh, some of the numbers mean. Now, we're going to get into scaling um, a few of the variables. So there's a couple of different ways that we can scale variables. The easiest, right, since we have uh, a number that goes up to 75, we can just divide that by, in this case, I'm dividing it by 15. Um, so that's going to bring it down. And our absences are now only going to be 15 going to be a 15th of what it was before, I think. But it's going to be, yeah, we're going to divide it by 15. That's going to bring that scale down um, so that our maximum number is now no longer 75. It's 75 divided by 15, which is 5, if I recall correctly. Uh, so that makes life much, much easier. When we get to some other variables that are a bit more complicated, in particular age, so let me bring up my summary again here. When we look at age, age doesn't have, has quite a small range, right? The range is only seven, but the minimum value is 15. So what we want to do is we want to standardize that so that we don't have any large numbers in there. And we could just, you could subtract 15 from all of those values and then add 15 to them later. Um, we can also just um, do a standard standardization, a, a normal standardization. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to take age, we will subtract the mean, and then divide by the standard deviation. And then what that's going to give us is that age, instead of being a scale from 15 to 22, age will be a scale from uh, around about zero, oh, sorry, around about minus one to one, centered around the mean. So zero will be whatever the mean is, um, plus one will be one standard deviation from the mean, and then minus one would be uh, one standard deviation below the mean. Um, knowing that you can divide something, sorry, subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation in order to standardize a variable is a really useful tool to have when you get into neural networks because you'll find you come across a lot of these variables where you have a big range or you have some outliers and things like that. You need to somehow scale it back in order to make the neural network work properly. The final thing we're going to do is we're going to scale um, what's called our targets, these G3, G1, G2, and G3. That's the grade for the course, um, the first part of the course, second part of the course, and G3 is the course as a whole. Uh, these are on a scale of 1 to 20. So we're going to standardize these. And instead of having them be on a scale of 1 to 20, we're going to have them be on a scale of 0 to 1. And again, this is all designed to make sure that we have a consistent input for our neural network, because we don't want anything that can't that's that's way out of whack with everything else, because it will make it difficult to work with. Now we'll just take a look at the uh, the summary, as I said, and this is just to check again that we haven't missed any variables. So you can see here was what I was talking about with the uh, with the age. So we go from now minus 1.3 to uh, plus 4, as it happens, because um, we had the 1 122 year old outlier, most of the uh, people in the class are 15, 16, 17. And then further down here, you can see the uh, ones we scaled from 1 to 0. And if I can find age, sorry, we talked about age. Um, and then if I can find the targets, which are here, so G1, G2, and G3, instead of going from 0 to 20, we're now going from 0 to uh, to 9.5 or 0 to 1. All right. You guys with me so far? I'll take that as a yes. Either you've dozed off or you're uh, still following along. So good stuff. All right. Now I'm going to teach you another little trick here. Um, this one's not strictly related to neural networks, um, but 
it's something that we can do in order to uh, make it a little bit easier to create our formulas when we have an enormous number of variables and we don't want to necessarily use all of the variables in the data set in our model. So we only want to pick a subset of variables to use in the model. Building a formula then, if you have a lot of variables in particular, as we do here, is kind of a pain in the backside. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to create a list of variables we want to keep. We're actually, in this case, we're going to remove them um, from our data. So you'll see, in this case, now we've gotten rid of uh, some of the variables we didn't scale and some of the variables we hadn't encoded as ones and zeros. And what we're looking at, the reason there's two of these, is because in this first one, so this first line here, this is all of the variables that we wanted to keep. So this is all of the variables in that list, summarized nicely. The second one is all of the variables not in that list. And you'll see that's all of our factors. You can see these ones all tend to have the numeric part. And then we don't want to use the previous marks to predict the current marks. Um, so we're taking those both out. The difference is this little exclamation point before names. So you can see summary um, where the column names for data are in this list of variables that we want to keep. Um, or you can say summary of the data where the names, the column names of the data are in the variables that we want to keep. But we want the opposite of that. So the opposite of that is obviously where the column names aren't in that list of uh, variables that we created. Now we're going to uh, just create our training and testing sets. Um, this is pretty standard. We're splitting them into 70% uh, and 30% for this particular set. Again, it doesn't make a big difference. Um, the one thing that you do want to do, particularly with neural networks, that you may not do with uh, other models is make sure you A, um, have enough data to train it on the training side, um, but also that you don't remove so much of the data um, or you, you leave enough to train it, but that you also leave enough to test it as well. Um, again, because these can be kind of finicky, there's a tendency to want to put as much data as possible into the training side of it, and we don't necessarily want to slip this down to be like 10% or 5% of all of our training data just because we don't have very much data to train it. All right, so now we have our training and our test sets. We're going to start um, creating our model. The, um, the little trick here, again, this looks really complicated, but all we're doing really is just creating a formula. So you'll see, if you look down at the bottom here, this uh, is the formula that I created. So using this little nifty piece of code, um, you can create a formula that says G3, um, predict G3 given all of these other variables. And the way we do that is we paste, use a, a paste function. Paste takes all of the items in a list and then stacks them together one after the other with this in between them. So what we're doing is we're taking the first item of the list, putting it down, then we're putting a plus sign next to it, adding the next item of the list, putting a plus sign next to it, then putting the next item of the list, adding a plus sign next to that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the way through the list. Um, and it's essentially just pasting all of the names um, of the training data set, um, except the target name. So this is a list of all the names of the target data set, except the target name. Uh, the reason I do this, rather than using that um, handy little g3 given dot function in this particular piece uh, is because this particular formula, the neural net formula, can be a bit finicky about how it takes, sorry, the neural net function can be a bit finicky about how it takes its formula. Sometimes it doesn't like to take this given the dot, it throws an error. Um, and the way to solve that is to give it exactly the same column names just to explicitly list them out. Um, and as you could see, uh, we have quite a lot of columns, and it's a pain in the backside to have to type that out or copy-paste it in every time. 
So if you use this, and it's a particularly a pain in the backside if you change one and say, hey, I don't actually want to use um, age or gender or address anymore. I'd like to take those out. And then you have to go through and you have to take them out here and take them out here and take them out here. Whereas if you do that, if you do it this way, you take them out of one place and then you can just run the rest of the code. Um, so again, we're just taking the names of the uh, training data sets, so the column names from the training data sets, where it's not the name of the target. In this case, the target is G3. Um, and then we're going to collapse them using this plus sign. So we're going to take one plus the next one plus the next one, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to give us this formula instead of having to put in this little dot and then have it throw an error. All right, training, I forgot to run something up at the top. That's embarrassing. There we go. Um, training a neural network is very simple. It works just like every other, uh, every other model that you've had. The options are not particularly um, complicated or convoluted. If we look at what happens in this neural net function here, um, you'll see there's a number of um, different things that we can try, a number of different parameters that we can tune. For the most part, unless you know what they do, don't mess with them. Some of them are quite easy to screw up by putting in the wrong number. Um, if you'd like to learn what they do, you can certainly read through the documentation. Um, again, there's some, some pretty good documentation on exactly what all of them do uh, in within R. And there's also some further links for, for further reading and things like that. Generally speaking, we want to use um, a couple of things to test it, uh, or sorry, to, to train it. We want to tune a couple of parameters. The first, obviously, is the number of um, neurons in this hidden layer. So that's going to be the number of nodes that we have between the input and the output layer and how they are divided up. So in this case, we have four in the hidden layer. We could add a second hidden layer with an additional four, or we could have eight in this one layer. Um, we could set it up any number of ways in order to do it. Um, the neural networks that, that we talked about at the beginning, the ones that do things like speech recognition and um, image recognition and things like that, they often have very complex structures on the inside. Um, for the most part, you want the network to be as simple as possible uh, while still giving you the accuracy uh, that you desire. So in this case, we're going to start off. Uh, we have quite a lot of variables. So we're going to start off with a, a neural network with a single hidden layer with 10 neurons. Single hidden layer with 10 neurons. Since we're predicting a, it's a regression, um, so we're trying to predict the uh, score out of 20, or the, as we scaled it, the score out of 1, um, that all of our students get, we're going to use linear output equals true. Um, if this was a classification problem, which we'll talk about in a minute, where we go down and look at pass fail, then we would want to use um, linear output equals false, and that would give us a classification um, classification solution. Um, so we'll train the neural network. You can see, even using this, right, this is a fairly limited amount of data. Um, I'm running on a relatively powerful computer. Um, but it still takes a noticeable amount of time to train the model. Um, these can take an awfully long time to train if you are uh, um, not careful about it. Uh, once we have our model and we examine it, you'll see the internal structure is quite wacky and doesn't all fit on one page. But that's okay because we have some uh, nifty little ways to access it. Um, so we can look at the model that we used to call the formula. Um, we can look at what the responses used to train the model were. So in this case, this is the scaled marks out of 20 for each of our students. Uh, we can look at the uh, values for each of the values in the input data set. Uh, we can look at the variables that we used to go in there. Um, this one's going to show us the predicted output for the first uh, 10 items of the training set. Uh, this is going to show us the weights after the final iteration. Now, I talked about weights a little bit earlier on. So these weights, you remember we had 10 neurons in our hidden layer. 
So those neurons are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 across the top. And then we have 26 variables. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, all the way to 26 on the left-hand side. So columns, neurons, rows are inputs. And this is just telling us that the first input to the first hidden node gets a weight of 0 0.057. The second variable to the first hidden node gets a weight minus 2.2, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the way down the list um, until we get to, if you wanted to, the 10th hidden node, uh, the 26th variable gets a weight of minus 3.894. Then we get to the second layer. Uh, the second layer takes these 10 five, seven, eight, nine, ten neurons from the hidden layer as inputs and outputs one single output layer. So you can see our output layer is one single neuron, which is the column, and then the ten input nodes are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Um, obviously they're being uh, but obviously um, there's 11 and there's 26 up here because there's one in each of these cases. There isn't actually an example of it in this particular diagram. But in um, each of these, there will be a an intercept. Um, so in the linear regression, that will be plus just a constant. Um, in this case, we're getting the same thing. So we're getting a constant that is put into the model. Um, so we get an extra, in air quotes, um, item when we look through this list, and that's just the intercept. Uh, we could also look at the uh, the start weights for each of the neurons. Again, this is going to give you the same metrics, same uh, matrix, but it's going to be the start weights for the neurons um, before we did any training on the model. Now, that might be useful because we might want to know that in some states um, a neural network trains well, but in other states it does not. Um, so that starting state what those weights were to start with that might have some impact on um, how the model trained and how accurate it is. So there might be some need for us to go in there and take a look at that. Um, if you wanted a list of the same coefficients, um, this is going to give you the list of the same coefficients. So, uh, we can almost get to the top of it. There we go. Um, so there's some details at the top. This is the intercept to hidden layer one age to hidden layer one, mother's education to hidden layer one, node one, um, and then all the way down, hidden layer one, node three, hidden layer one, node five, etc., etc., etc. And all that does is just spell out explicitly what the weight is for each of the pathways. So if you look at um, this list, and then you wanted to compare it to our diagram, this is just listing out what the weight is for each of these arrows all the way through the diagram. So you could, if you wanted to uh, to recreate this outside of R, you could, in theory, just write out all of that. Um, spend a long time doing it, but you could. All right, we can also plot our neural network to get a good view of uh, what it looks like. Um, so again, this is, you can see, similar to this type of a diagram and a bit more complicated because we have a bit more in the hidden layer. Um, you can see that we have in this case our two intercepts. So we have intercept up um, this blue line coming up away from the output node um, and then we have another blue line another blue uh, node rather coming out from uh, the nodes in the hidden layer. Those are the two intercepts, one for each of the hidden layer and the output layer. Um, and then we have all of our variables listed on the left-hand side. And if you wanted to zoom in really, really far in here, which you can't really do, you can see that each of these pathways has the weight um, associated with it. So this is a good way to uh, sort of visualize what your network, um, what your network looks like. Um, it can give you a sense of maybe uh, which of these nodes have a heavy positive influence and which of them have a heavy negative influence. So let's figure out how good it was. Let's make some predictions um, using this network that we just trained. Um, so what we're going to do here first is we're going to create some predictions. 
Um, in this case, we are computing G3. Um, and then we're going to take those predictions and we're going to multiply them by 20. And the reason we're going to do that is because it reverses the scale that we put on them at the beginning. If you remember, we scaled them back by 20 um, early on so that we could get a nice consistent range across all of our variables. So now in order to get them back on the same scale, we just have to move them out by 20 again. Um, again, not, uh, not a big deal, but you do have to remember to do it. Well, uh, that's not particularly promising. There's a lot of marks around 10 in the middle, but there doesn't seem to be any particular trend. Um, in particular, uh, there doesn't seem to be a nice line um, along which all of the scores are distributed. Um, also, our marks only go from 20 to 0, um, but because this is a regression and we haven't put any bounds on it, we have a number of items that are below 0, we have a number of items that are above 20. Um, so, that's something that we may want to be careful with um, if we were going to deploy that. To be honest, there's probably not enough training data in here for us to get a really good neural network out of it. Um, so we're skimping a little bit just to save training time. So if we wanted to make it better, one of the things that we can do is we can add more hidden nodes. So in this case, we'll add a second hidden layer um, of 10 nodes. So if you recall earlier on where it said hidden um, in our neural net formula, um, after we put in our formulas, this is G3, the little wiggly line dot, um, or list of list of the variables, training data. Within the hidden layer, um, we want two layers of 10 nodes, and we want to continue with our linear output. So let's see what that does. Um, and then again, we're just going to make the predictions, and then I'm just going to plot them right out here. We're not going to go through all of that code over again. So it's training the neural network. You can see that this takes, um, again, exponentially longer because there's more, um, more nodes in this particular layer. And when we do that, you can see that uh, this plot looks a bit more promising than the other one. Probably not perfect. We did have a couple of a handful of people below zero, which is probably not fantastic. But we do have more of a trend. Um, excuse me, more of a a cluster, as it were, between zero and twenty. Um, and they do appear to be somewhat clustered on that um, on that positive slope that we'd expect. Um, it also seems fairly unusual for this particular class to give anything between a 5 and a 0, um, or anything up to a 20, which might be confusing the, the model a little bit too. Um, if we wanted to look at the error, which we can do, you know what, I'm going to skip that temporarily, because I'm not sure why I wrote that there. Oh, it looks like we have somebody else. Welcome. All right. So that was um, basically during neural networks for um, regression, right? Because we're trying to predict something on a scale. But what if we only wanted to predict whether somebody was going to pass the class or not? Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to set up a variable that allows us to uh, determine whether somebody passed. I've, picked 50% as my passing grade. So if you get more than 50%, you pass. Um, if you get less than 50%, you didn't pass. So what we're going to do is we're going to set pass equal to zero. Then we're going to say pass where your marks were greater than 50% is one. Otherwise, it's going to stay zero. I'm going to do a quick check here just to make sure that uh, I didn't screw anything up. Um, if one of these formulas on either line 2 or 3 or line 206 was bad, then when I ran this um, this mean function on line 209, I'd get either 1 or 0 in uh, for the mean, whereas what I've got is 67%. Uh, so it looks like we're in business. Both of those worked. We have some people who passed and some people who failed. Um, again, we're going to create this nice list of variables. Oh, and uh, Elena just sent me a note that says that it looks like Leo is back up. So those of you that are having trouble accessing Leo, um, that should be back up. Um, maybe, that, uh, maybe that's why we've had a couple of other people join us here. All right, so uh, we were creating the, uh, the variables here. 
Um, again, we're just doing exactly the same thing that we did above. So we're just creating this list of variables that we want to keep. Um, when we do that, we're going to go through and then again split into our training and test sets, keeping only these variables. Um, in this case, you'll notice that I made sure I got rid of that G3 um, variable that we used to define whether somebody was uh, was passing or failing, because obviously we don't want to cheat um, and say that we knew whether some we knew what somebody's marks were going to be, so we decided whether they were going to pass or fail there. Um, we created our new training and test set, and then again uh, we're going to create a formula and again in exactly the same way that we did before. This is um, exactly the same formula, so we're going to say when pass little squiggly line, and then we're going to paste out all of the names um, of our training data, so all of the column names from our training data um, that aren't the target name, and we're going to stick them together with this plus sign, and then that's going to return this formula down here where we've got pass, pass given age plus blah, 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 all the rest of the variables. Then we're going to create another neural network. Let's do another one with uh, 10, a single a uh, hidden layer with 10 neurons in it. Uh, in this case, you'll note the only difference is that we set the linear output to false, because in this case, we're not predicting uh, something on a regression scale. We are predicting um, a classification. Um, so we want everything to be given either a one or a zero for pass or fail. We don't want to be given um, a scale from zero to 20 anymore. So we'll train that. Uh, again, it takes just a second. Um, actually trained a little bit quicker, that one. There you go. And we can take a look at the weights. So again, this is the same matrix. You'll see this looks identical to the one that we looked at before. So we have our 10 um, nodes, the 10 nodes in the hidden layer, along with um, the weight that each variable gets when they go into that. And then, whoops. Um, and then we can do the same thing. We can plot that again. When we get out here, you'll see that this looks a little bit different. Um, and in this case, we're predicting pass. You can see that some of these numbers have changed um, actually pretty drastically. So we had uh, mostly like one, two, three, four in the first one. In this one, we have some pretty big numbers, um, you know, minus 49, 22, 30. So uh, it's definitely something different happening with this particular one. Uh, we can also make some predictions with it. So we're going to use this to predict uh, the predict using the uh, the network we just trained um, on the test data. This is the test data that we created up there. Um, and obviously, we're going to exclude pass from the variables that we pass into that because we don't want to predict using um, our what in this case is our one that we're going to use to check the accuracy of it. Uh, and then we're going to round them because this, let's see if we just run this singly, uh, it's going to give us a probability. So you can see up here, this is a list of our probabilities. We've got one, or by nine, and then blah, 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 blah. Um, we don't want the probability. What we want, since we want to create a nice little neat confusion matrix is we just want to round those to whatever the nearest whole number is. So it's either going to round to one or zero, depending on whether we predict somebody will pass or fail. You'll notice, so before we got these ludicrously long decimals, this time we've got just ones and zeros, which is fantastic. One of the ways to uh, check the accuracy, which I didn't do in the previous case, is to look at what the mean, you remember up here at the top, we looked at what the mean of our passing students was, right? So we got 67% passed. Down here, we can do the same thing with our prediction. And we can see how accurate our model might be or how precise our model might be by looking at the same um, numbers by just taking the mean of what we predict and then determining whether that's close to the mean of what actually happened. In this case, it is. So we, we had 67% of students who passed the first time. Then we have 65% of students this time who uh, who passed. So. Let's take a look at a confusion matrix. And this isn't actually too bad, certainly better than the 
random collection of dots that doesn't seem to have any relationship to people's grades are. Um, so we got 15 true negatives. That's what we predicted they would get a zero, and uh, they got a zero. Well, they we predicted they'd fail, and they failed. And we've got 62 uh, true positives. So we predicted they passed, and they passed. And then we have uh, 18 false positives. Sorry. Um, 18 false negatives where we thought they would fail, um, but they passed, and then vice versa, 27 uh, false negatives. I'm sorry, I've got that the wrong way around. We have 27 um, false negatives where we thought they would fail and they passed, um, and then we have 18 false positives where we thought they'd pass and they failed. Um, again, potentially we might be able to do better. So let's get a bit let's get a bit crazy, right? We're probably getting a bit too much into overfitting here. We wouldn't want to necessarily add this many layers, but instead of having ten uh, nodes in our hidden layer, let's jump it up and we'll put forty, three layers of forty nodes a piece, and let's see what that does to the accuracy. So I'll make some predictions, round the predictions, and then create another table, right? And you can see that, uh, in this case, it's done a much better job of identifying those who would pass. We've got 71 versus 62. Um, we didn't, though, get much more accurate um, in terms of the false positives and the false negatives. We managed to gain some of them. Uh, we managed, looks like we managed to turn people that we predicted would fail into people that actually did a better job of identifying people that we thought would pass um, instead of saying they'd fail and finding out that they passed. Um, but there's still obviously a lot of room for improvement there. Uh, in this particular case, we probably don't have the amount of training data that we need to support um, a neural network with, uh, what's that, 120 neurons across three layers. Um, so that is something to be aware of as you work through these. Um, well, you can sometimes build something that looks a little bit better um, by getting really aggressive with the number of neurons, but um, it may not may be overfitting. Um, it's very easy to overfit um, with a neural network because they are so flexible. So we have to make sure that we uh, put constraints in place to try and avoid that happening. Um, down at the bottom of the script, if you read all the way to the bottom of the script, uh, you will find two things um, that are common, really irritating problems. Um, I swear every time I write a new script to build a neural network, these two things bite me in the ass at least once. Um, the first one is that you'll run the neural network and you'll make some predictions and all of your predictions have the same value. Uh, it's kind of annoying to debug and you have to go back through and make sure that you've checked all the right boxes. Um, the first thing is to make sure that whatever you put for the linear dot output part of your neural net formula um, is set to either true or false. So that you're predicting, you're telling it that you're predicting either um, a, if you're doing either a regression or a classification problem, depending on which one it is. Um, you also want to make sure all of your variables are scaled on similar ranges. This is particularly important for the second one of these, which we'll get to um, in a second. And you can also try using more um, or sometimes fewer nodes uh, in the hidden layer. The reason for this is if you don't use enough points in that hidden layer to model whatever the complexity um, of your data, then it's just going to predict usually whatever the majority class is, or it's going to give you some um, some wacky value, right? It's just going to pick the average, and then it's always going to predict the average because it just doesn't have enough flexibility to get into that. Um, vice versa, if you give it too much flexibility, then it will mold itself around the problem, and when you give it new, tr new testing data that it hasn't seen before, it doesn't understand what to do with it. So again, it ends up just flat predicting the average. Um, so those are a couple of common things you can call. That's one common thing you can come across. The second common thing you'll come across is uh, 
a little warning that you get when you run the neural network that says the net didn't converge. Uh, basically, you want to look at the same handful of things. It's usually caused by one of the same things. In particular, in this case, I would look at how the variables have scaled. So if you have variables that are scaled from um, you know, 0 to 75 and other variables that are scaled from 0 to 1, you might want to get those onto a common scale um, before you try and uh, create your neural network. Um, and that should work a lot better. Um, so with all of that said, um, that is the end of the script. Um, so that's all I was going to cover. Do you guys have any questions? Um, is there anything you would like to go back and, and have me cover in a little bit more detail? Hey, John, this is Will. Um, when you did the multiple layers, you made them all the same, like you did 40, 40, 40. Um, can you talk more about that, why, why that choice was made? Uh, I made that choice because it's uh, a little bit easier to understand if you keep the layers the same. You can um, scale down the layers if you want. So you could go 40 in this one. You could do like 40, 30, 20 or 40, 25, um, however you wanted to do that. Um, it gets very complex. Uh, not necessarily complex in terms of the model, but complex to keep track of as you work through the training um, portions of it, right? If you vary that number um, significantly from layer to layer. Um, I, I wouldn't, I would suggest unless you have a lot of data um, and something that's really, really complex, you, you probably don't need to go beyond even two hidden layers. Um, and if you do that, you can vary the number of neurons between the two to try and get a balance. Um, so it was really the, the choices that were made in this particular case were done for the, the simplicity of the script. There's no hard and fast rule that says you have to keep um, that number of layers or, or the, the number of neurons in each hidden layer the same. Okay. Um, I, I had some other questions too. You, we we got this um, scale function that I've been using to scale everything. You mm -hmm. scale things manually. Um, what what are, is there are there any risk using the scale function rather than or, or do or should we scale them manually like you did? Uh, there's no risk to it. You can use it. Uh, I did it manually so that you guys could see exactly um, what I was doing and why I was doing it. Uh, I think the scale function is useful, but sometimes it helps to understand exactly what's going on behind the scenes. So all I'm doing is yeah. um, unpacking it a little bit so that you can see what's going on. There should be a note. Uh, I'm not sure if I called it out, but there should be a note within all of that scaling stuff um, about using yeah. the scale function. Now, um, you can scale factors as well as numeric and integers. The scale takes everything as an argument. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. And the, the other question I have is when you had the output and you made it true or false, whether it was a classification uh, or not, um, does that have to be, does the, does the dependent variable have to be a factor if you make it a classification or can it be an integer and still be a classification or does it matter? Uh, it's, it can still be an integer and be a classification. In the case of, uh when I create the pass, right? So when I create um, this variable right here, that's going to create it as uh, an integer. And then this is also going to keep it as an integer. Um, but I pass it in here. When we pass it into here, right? I don't do anything else to it until we pass it in, but I tell it it's a classification problem. So, so you can use an integer um, as a classification to, to, to drive a classification problem as long as that that output is, is equal to false. That's why that's one of the things that you want to check. If you start getting some wacky results, um, check that you have that linear output set correctly. Because I find you know, sometimes you copy and paste some code, right? And then you, you forget to change it. Um, and that can, that's, that's sometimes a cause of issues. Um, but you can use either one. OK, so and where it got confusing for me is when you have to take that and put it into a a more fixed number that was for the confusion matrix, not for the not for the predictions. 
Mm -hmm. It automatically predicts one to zero if you set the linear output to false, right? But the confusion matrix is different because you have to you have to define it or cast it, I guess, as a one or a zero. Yes. So what happens when you go to make the predictions, right? So I just took this network and I I made the first level of predictions. And if you look at this list, um, this is actually a list of probabilities. So this is telling you the probability that the first student in this test set passes is 0.999999999, which is probably, um, that's fairly confident. Um, yeah, the probability that the fourth student passes is 0.69. Now, uh, we can't really put those into a confusion matrix, right? Because it would be, we just have this enormous matrix with one thing in every box. So all I'm doing is I'm saying that, well, if we, if we, if the probability is above 0.5 that this student's going to pass, then we would predict that they pass. Um, if it's below 0.5, then we would predict that they fail. And then I'm using those, I, I'm, I'm just um, rounding it to create that one or that zero, and then that's what we're putting into the confusion matrix, right? So it's really, all I'm doing is I'm taking the probabilities that come out of the, the neural net model, and then I'm just taking whatever the prediction is. Right, you're them. I get matrix. it. Yeah, if it's yeah. above 0.5, right. it will yeah, go yeah. to 1. Yeah. Exactly. No, that makes exactly. perfect sense. This, this has been very helpful. Sorry for asking too many questions. I was going to ask. No, you're fine. You're fine. Did anybody else have any, uh, any questions? Hey. Yeah, uh, will you be uh, putting this out to us to share, uh, see the um, coding? So yeah, so we're gonna um, we're recording this right now, and then uh, yeah. as oh. soon as we're done and we get the recording, Yelena is gonna post it up in the classroom for everyone to see. I know we had some technical issues getting people in, so um, if there's any questions or anything like that, feel free to shoot me an email or post in the uh, questions for the TA forum, and we'll uh, we'll get to those ASAP. Because Leo, so you're gonna put. On. Go ahead. No, you're going to put the video, right? Are you going to put mm -hmm. the co R coding to R code too? Yep, so you will get um, you'll get the video, obviously. Um, you'll get this um, R script that we've been working our way through here. Um, you'll get this data table, which has um, all of the data in it so that you can run the code yourself. Um, and then somewhere in here. It's in a tabular format. I put it as a table in the announcement. And there are several links. You would need to click on the link to download. Yeah, and then there's this um this list of data descriptions too. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So Thank I'll you. share that with you so you know what's in the in the data. Yeah. John sends this to me after this class and I'm mm -hmm. like, Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll package it all up. You can even have my PowerPoint with a picture and a picture in it if you want. <laughs> I yeah, think I'll it's very useful to anyone. I'll post the version you sent. Yeah. Leo is back up, so should be good. Inconvenient timing for the uh, start of this. Mm. Uh, so, does anybody else have any questions? John, this was very helpful. Um, it really helped clarify a lot of questions I had. I was, I was struggling with trying to understand the factors versus the numeric on the input and the output. So it clarified a lot of things for me. And the other thing you really clarified is how you set up the hidden, the hidden nodes. I was, I was using the wrong, um, the wrong uh, syntax and nomenclature. I don't know what you call it when I was passing it to the, to the formula, and it was really messing up. So, if it's any consolation, when I first used on to, uh, to use this package. I had no idea how to pass in more than one hidden layer, so everything I did with it was a single hidden layer. <laughs> it was the only yeah. thing I knew how to do. So it's, uh, I'm, I'm glad it's helpful. But uh, thanks. I'm, I'm glad everyone was uh, able to join us. Uh, we'll get the recording, as I said, posted up as soon as possible with all the uh, scripts and stuff. Oh, so. Thanks. All right. Thank you, John. Thank you.
up, so are we done? Uh, I think so. Yep. So we can go ahead and uh, and stop, stop and I'll send it over to you. Okay. You send me. A